of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Years ago, I remember hearing a story uh, that was actually told by Dr. James Dobson, the founder of Focus on the Family. And uh, he made the decision to take a flight uh, on Southwest Airlines. Uh, some of you know the joys of that, no assigned <laughs> seats. Um, and he was exhausted. Uh, he was, uh, had to, got a last minute flight and you know, he thought, I just, he, he was incognito. He said he almost tried to disguise himself <laughs> because he really didn't want to meet anybody or talk to anybody on the plane and uh, he was going to this conference. He wanted to get his last minute's notes taken care of. And uh, he just wanted peace. He was seated next to the window. And all of a sudden, he sees somebody walking down the aisle that was the last person he ever would want to see or meet or talk to. This guy was a biker. He had multiple piercings. He was covered with tattoos. And just so you all know, I'm not ragging on people with tattoos. I've got two kids that are covered with them. Um, but uh, James Dobson looked at this guy and said, please move on, please move on, please move on. And he plopped down sat right next to him. And, you know, he was just reading a book or something, and he's trying, you know, to... And this guy wanted to talk. Y'all had that joy on an airplane where, yeah, you don't ever want to sit next to me. Um, I, am, I am an extreme extrovert. I talk to people in the elevators. Uh, that's how bad I am. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, so he's, he finally gets him like, ugh, I got to say hi to this person. And he realized as they started talking, this guy didn't have a clue who he was. And then he thought, I'm not really surprised. I don't really make it well in the biker circuit, but, you know, who knows. <laughs> and, well, you know, what are you going to California for? I'm going to this meeting. Uh, what are you going? Well, I'm, I'm going to be speaking at a conference. Cool. <laughs> what conference are you speaking at? And he told him, he said, praise God, brother, I'm going to the same thing. <laughs> he said, really? Who are you going to hear? I don't know, some guy that you know, from friends of mine thought I ought to hear, and they just all chipped in the money, and so I'm going. I, I just got the address. I don't know who's talking, and I don't know what they're talking about, but I trust my brothers. And he said, well, I'm the one you're going to hear. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> Isn't God awesome? And he said, well, what do you do? And he said, I got a biker church. Well, James Dobson never heard of a biker church. And then he proceeded to basically say, I'm a gospel minister. And James Dobson said, God convicted me on the spot about how often we prejudge people. I should have titled this sermon uh, Airplane Evangelism. <laughs> uh, because yesterday I was coming back from Alabama um, when I thought I was retiring, which I've miserably flunked now for the third time. Um, I actually accepted a consulting position with a church that's in trouble uh, in uh, Alabama. And uh, so I was coming back last night because I had to make sure I caught that last flight or I would not be here this morning. And uh, again, I just want a little peace and quiet. But 
of course, I wasn't on Southwest, thank God. And uh, I had assigned seats. So from the town in Alabama, which I won't say because the guilty will remain innocent, <coughs> I had to, you either go from that town to Charlotte or that town to Atlanta. So I was going to Atlanta, short flight. I thought, you know, nobody's going to want to strike up a conversation. What were you doing in, Mo in uh, Alabama? Now, you know what town I was in, <laughs> in Montgomery. And uh, what, what, uh, what were you doing there? And I said, well, I was, uh, I was just consulting. Really? Doing what? And I'm like, well, what were you doing in that town? And she said, well, I'm from New York. And she said, I'm working on my bucket list. And I grew up as a little girl in this town, and I wanted to come back before I go. And I said, oh, fortunately, I'm not that old. Um, getting there, but uh, OK, working on the bucket list. She said, yeah, she said, I wanted to go back to my home church. Well, you know where this is going. <laughs> And I said, oh, really? I'm kind of in the church world also. And she said, well, what are you? And I said, I'm an Episcopalian. She had no clue what that was. And I said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. And I said, so was it a good visit? And she said, it was sad because the church was closed. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And I, she said, I, I was hoping I would get the pastor to pray for me because I got cancer and I'm dying. Well, of course God's going to put her right next to me. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I'm going to confess. I said, I am a Christian. I am a pastor. I would be delighted to pray with you. And on that little 33-minute flight, God showed up. Get to Atlanta. I'm in concourse A. I got to go to concourse B. I have 23 minutes. I arrive on the corn concourse B. They're starting to board my plane. And there is a couple, young couple, with a double stroller three other children under six and they are all screaming. You know, it's you know, it's past dinner time, they should be going to bed. You know, quintraphonic stereo screaming. Where are they going to sit? Right behind me, the whole row across. And so I, I look at the woman I'm sitting next to, and, you know, because what I was really doing is praying that that would be an empty seat. And uh, wasn't a biker preacher, but I, I know she has a, a motorcycle. She's a pretty, pretty rough looking gal. And, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. Melbourne, Florida. She said, I said, what were you doing? You know, she said, I've been, I'm an artist and I'm going on a tour of murals. Interesting. Well, what were you doing? I thought, well, this will shut the conversation up quickly. Uh, I said, I'm actually an Episcopal priest and I'm, uh, uh, I've been consulting with a church in Alabama. And she said, oh. She said, I don't go to church. I'm a lapsed Roman Catholic. And I said, well, you know, you should look at the Episcopal Church, because we got a lot of lapsed Roman Catholics. <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, maybe, you know, I'll see. And I said, so where are you going? I'm going to Colorado Springs. And I'm 
mic. God is so good. I have a son who's a priest in Colorado Springs. And I said, uh, you know where the interstate and uh, Woodman Road is? Yeah, yeah, I don't live too far from there. That's exactly the right answer I wanted to hear. And I said, why don't you go to St. Michael's uh, Episcopal Church? And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call my son so he'll make sure that he looks out for you. What's your first name? And uh, gee, isn't this a crazy coincidence? And I said, no, it's not really a coincidence. I said, uh, you know, the God I worship is the God of very fine detail. And he works things out in ways I could never manipulate if I tried. I said, so you're an artist. Well, you will be, I tell you what, even if you don't go to church, you've got to go to St. Michael's because they have just received a St. John's Bible. It's the last <coughs> handwritten manuscript that has been produced. And there's only going to be 300 copies. They've got copy 199. Um, I said, the artwork is phenomenal. I said, it should be for $175,000 uh, for the book and then another eighty dollars for the museum quality cases and all that stuff. I said, it was a memorial to a young woman who died. And I said, but you have to go see the art. And if you show up on Sunday morning, that's okay too. Because I said, it's actually the only St. John's Bible that's available for public sight in the state of Colorado. I'm intrigued. I've never heard of that. I think I'll go tomorrow. And in 1 Corinthians, from the reading this morning, we read, I've made myself a servant of all. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law. I become weak so I could minister to the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might win some. You see, the nice thing about the Bible is that there's not one set of instructions for believers and another set of instructions for non-believers and a third set of instructions for clergy. You know, all of this was done by lay people reaching out to other lay people. And I got news for you. If I was Paul... I wouldn't have gotten out of Corinth as soon as I possibly could. Corinth was a mess, if you've never studied First and Second Corinthians. Uh, capital of the um, uh, Achaia, the eastern part of Greece. Uh, they had uh, Olympic-type um, uh, games uh, every other year. There were temples to Poseidon and Artemis and uh, emperor's temple, emperor worship temples, and, you know, there were seafarers and merchants, you know, going back and forth on the Mediterranean, and it was not a hotbed um, for religion. In fact, as much as he scolds the church at Corinth, there's a lot more sinning than believing going on there. And yet, God called him there on a second missionary journey, and he spent 18 months. It's there that he met Priscilla and Aquila, which were what? They were kicked out of Rome because the emperor issued a decree that all Jews had to leave Rome. They're in exile. They're, they went to Corinth. They're tent makers. Oh, isn't that interesting? Paul is a tent maker. That's why he stayed there and he lived with them. It's there that he's going to encounter
many other significant people. Silas and Barnabas are going to come and meet him in Corinth, and they are going to do what, as all p church people do when they get together? No, they didn't worship and they didn't pray, but they did have a good church fight. And it's at Corinth during Paul's second missionary journey. You can read about it when you go home, Acts 18, and you'll see that Paul decided, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm not going to go to the synagogues. I'm not going to go just to the Jews. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, to the Gentiles. They don't fight as much. They get converted much easier. I mean, he's not saying this, but this is my my mind thinking what Paul was saying. And once he set his mind to deal with the Gentiles, he has a vision from God, and God comes to him and he says, you will not be harmed. Basically, stay here. My hand of protection is over you. And Paul stayed there for 18 months before he went back to Antioch. You see, too often times we think proclaiming the gospel is about sermons. It's what the clergy do. It's not. Proclamation of the gospel is simply talking about Jesus in your own words to whoever he brings into your fold. And it might be the crazy lady who's doing her bucket list and terribly disappointed after flying from New York to Alabama. The church is closed. Or it might be a biker church preacher. Or it might be a, an artist that's wandering around looking for some meaning or hope. Who will God bring into your sphere of influence this week? Will you see them as an intrusion? Will you see them as some nameless, faceless person on the road? Or will you see them as the person that God has brought specifically to sit next to you? Even if you're screaming and preaching over six screaming kids behind you. <laughs> Take the opportunity. Be obedient to the call to be a proclaimer of the gospel. And remember, unfortunately, the rest of that phrase, in season or out of season. Whether it's comfortable, whether 